All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, so thank you so much for joining in on YouTube as we continue to celebrate amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities from across the globe. Today, we are joined live in Georgia by Dr. Kim Cobb, and she is the director of the Global Change Program at Georgia Tech University. She has launched expeditions to the deep tropics. She's gone to Borneo in pursuit of corals and caves in understanding the past, present, and future of climate change. She speaks incredibly widely on these topics all around the globe. Um, it's her third time joining us. We're so thrilled to have her. And I can't help but end her intro by saying what she announces herself on Twitter, which is that she's 40% climate scientist, 40% mom, and 20% Indiana Jones. And I love it. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Cobb, and take it away. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much, Jesse. It's an honor to be back on your show, if you will, uh, talking about corals and climate change, two of my favorite subjects. And uh, I would note that for the moment, my Twitter bio should very much be amended to 80% mom, <laughs> 5% scientist, and 0% Indiana Jones, and the rest of it is just mental bandwidth that can't exist. So it's, uh, it's a very uh, disruptive time for all of us, and I want to give a shout out to all of those teachers and students who are getting through these days, uh, Monday through Friday. I know how it is homeschooling four children here in my house. So um, thank you, teachers, for all that you do, and thank you, students, for all that you do to keep science in your lives and to uh, share community together during this time. I'm really proud and honored to be with you today. So without further ado, I wanna get started in, in talking a little bit about um, the work that I do at Georgia Tech as a climate scientist and how we use coral records to peer back in time and look at past temperature and rainfall extremes, try to figure out if they're changing today and what that means for our future. So without further ado, let me uh, share my, my slides here and we can get going with some pretty pictures because we all need pretty pictures in science and coral reefs are incredibly photogenic. So that, that gives us a lot to look at today and even more to talk about. So there's my Twitter handle if y'all want to check out um, my Twitter feed. I, I share a lot of up-to-date news about corals and climate change, including some of which I'll share today that just broke. So without further ado, let's get started with the basics. Uh, what is a coral exactly? And you will not be surprised to hear that I've heard all kinds of answers from students ranging from plants to fungus to bacteria, uh, animals. And of course, uh, the coral itself is an animal, but it's quite confusing because inside the coral uh, live a microscopic uh, algae that photosynthesize for them. So they are kind of uh, in a symbiotic relationship with those algae that give them food. And they're also a microbial soup in the mucus and tissues in the coral that it become a really important part of the coral function as well. So it's a lot of things, a coral, and that's what, it's, what makes it so special in the animal kingdom and such a critical part of our ocean's health. Here's a close-up of a coral that you can see here. And you can see the tentacles that help it filter feed in the water. You can also see how it's going to shove all that food that it captures down into its mouth like that uh, in the center image. And you can see below the building block of the coral that it's building underneath what you can see, uh, that hard skeleton that's going to lock in the climate record that my lab uses to peer back in time and look at past ocean conditions, specifically temperature. And so here is a picture of me scuba diving on a remote reef in the tropical Pacific. And here I'm drilling a coral core. So you can see that cylinder coming out of the coral colony is a white, uh, a white record of past coral skeleton that's going to help us look back year by year by year by year. In this case, this coral will go back to about 1950 and way before temperatures were recorded in this very remote area. And this area is so remote that it's actually in the geographic middle of the Pacific Ocean. And here you can see a map of that glorious ocean covers half of our planet. 
So when the Pacific talks about its climate, everybody listens. <laughs> we don't have a choice. So it drives so much about what happens in climate wherever you are on the planet, from Greenland to Antarctica, here in Georgia included, you are impacted by a climate cycle called El Nino that originates right in the middle of the Pacific where I've been conducting research for 20 years. These sites are incredibly beautiful. So I fell in love on my first research ex expedition to these sites in 1997, and I've tried to take every opportunity to get back there and do more work and learn more of the secrets from these very remote places that of course have been here way before we ever set foot on them as humans. And of course, we'll be here probably through geologic time as well, uh, providing in this case, amazing records of the history of oceans in the past. So these have names like Palmyra Island, Fanning Island, and most importantly, Christmas Island, which is where I've done most of my work. My children love that island name. So what's happening to corals right now is that as ocean temperatures warm up, the corals are bleaching in response to that temperature stress something that they've learned to do over geologic time to adapt to very short-lived temperature spikes that occur like weather happens in our backyards here. But the problem what's happening with climate change is that those temperature spikes are getting more frequent and they're also getting warmer when they do occur. And that is stressing corals out around the world because they cannot stand it when it gets too hot. And so I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is a super close up microscope image of a bleached coral where you can see the clear tissue that is the coral animal itself and then just just a couple little green dots left inside the tissue that is the algae that usually keeps the coral very well fed when ocean temperatures are in the optimal range for corals. Now it gets too hot those algae will actually leave the coral tissue and the coral tissue will remain uh, white or clear against the white skeleton that's underneath it. And that coral is unfortunately missing a very large portion of its food stores that it typically gets from those very busy photosynthesizing algae. And so this is okay if it happens for two or three weeks or maybe one or two months maximum. But if this bleaching occurs for longer than three months, then the coral literally will starve to death. And so this is what we're up against when we start talking about uh, corals bleaching more frequently because of warming temperatures and of course, in some cases, dying. And unfortunately, as you've probably heard at other places, uh, the oceans are warming quite quickly as the planet as a whole warms now quite quickly. And this is the best image that I've found to illustrate how temperatures have changed over the last 100 years. And so what you're looking at here is an illustration by Professor Ed Hawkins looking at the blues, which are uh, beginning in 1880 and then moving into the very deep reds the last bar there is 2019, which was the second warmest year on record. And then you can see in between, they go up and down year by year. But in general, these last couple decades have been a record warm, uh, record warm decades. And of course, uh, the last five years have been uh, some of the warmest on record. And I wanna mark that by showing my nice scarf today that I'm wearing, my warming stripes scarf, which you can also sport uh, to show uh, your, um, care about our planet and your literacy about climate change. So here's the, the last 10 years, and, and this is the first 10 years, and I think this is the 1990s, and this is the 1890s. So just a bit of illustration to get us further in the mood. And unfortunately, my research site in the Central Pacific is not immune to this kind of warming. Even though it's so far away, the oceans are absorbing most of the heat that we're driving into the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. And so this is a picture of the reef that I've been working at um, for 20 plus years now. Um, in 2014, this is a picture of a, of a very healthy reef, almost 100% coral cover. You can see it's healthy by the, by the amount of coverage, almost not a bare spot, and also by the different species that you can see and the different colors and shapes of corals. That's all indicator of a very healthy reef environment. If you look over to the right, you're going to see a very different picture taken from the same reef 
uh, about two years later during an ocean temperature extreme in which 85% of the corals at this site died due to 10 months of bleaching level temperatures at this site. Now this was a naturally occurring temperature extreme associated with a massive El Nino event, the largest on record, but also some portion of that temperature extreme was made more extreme by the underlying warming that has occurred over the last decades. So, and I wanted to also bring you straight up to date today with the latest news out of the Great Barrier Reef just released one hour ago from the uh, ARC Center for Excellence of Coral Reefs in Australia, looking at the surveys they've been conducting over the last weeks. And here you can see on the left, a picture of a uh, early bleaching event on the Great Barrier Reef just reported a couple months ago on Twitter, those pale looking corals, not normal. And then if you go over to the map that you see there, you can see that the map they released today, looking at the scuba diving surveys of bleached reefs extending from the northern tip of the Great Barrier Reef all the way down into the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef, those reds indicating current bleaching, corals that are at threat of dying, and the greens indicating corals that have thus far escaped the latest temperature extreme in Australia. So this isn't just about 2016 and my site in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This is something that's going to be happening again and again and again if, if we allow ocean temperatures to continue to rise. Now, I get this all the time when I talk to people about climate change. Oh, Dr. Cobb, is it too late? Is there anything we can do? What can I do? It's not too late to fix climate change. This is not a pass fail course where we're already locked into an F, so just throw in the towel. This is something we can stop if we put our minds to it. And we may not get an A plus, but you know what? I'll settle for an A minus right now. So let's talk about how we can get our, our grade up in climate change and, uh, and work together to solve this and avert some of the worst uh, impacts that are to come, not just to reef systems, of course, those are just early warning signs, but of course on our doorsteps uh, here across the, the uh, uh, North America and beyond. So I wanna focus on what kids can do because kids can play a huge role. Kids are already playing a huge role in climate solutions. So I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but you can help here in your daily lives, as well as help raise awareness about this issue amongst people who really care about you, like your parents and your teachers and your schools. And anybody who really cares about climate will care a lot about what you have to say. First, you can conserve gas as you think about what kind of car you're going to buy when you do buy one or your parents buy one, um, conserve that gas and, and keep uh, fuel efficiencies up and turn off those lights. My kids are terrible at this. I'm always chirping at them. It does matter because if we all do that, it adds up pretty quickly. You'd be surprised. The second thing you can do is look around the bulbs in your house and make sure that you have high efficiency bulbs in your sockets. They have a little plastic sleeve on the bottom instead of the ones that are all glass, which are about 20, 30 year old technology, that's almost 10 times more dangerous for climate change than the more efficient bulbs. And of course, here's a picture of kids biking to school. If that's safe in your neighborhood, you can do that. We started biking and walking my kids to school a couple of years ago. And I have to tell you, it's been super great. I love getting the exercise in the morning and spending time with them. The second thing is don't waste food because that's a huge cause of climate change. You heard it here. This is science talking. Um, the more food we waste, and it turns out we are extremely wasteful with food. So not just in our households, but also at our schools, our places of work, um, and all of the systems that go into food, very, very wasteful. So let's do what we can to create less waste in our own lives. The third thing you can do is think about what goes into your mouth. And the number one thing there is to eat less beef. Red meat is almost 10 times more uh, climate intensive than any other meat you would like to put on your plate. So that's a big thing that kids can do. The fourth thing that kids can do is thinking about planting trees in their neighborhood. Now you might say, well, that tree is gonna take a long time to grow and I'm impatient. Well, that's true, but if you plant enough trees and enough of us do it, then actually the most, the most, uh, the time when the tree absorbs the most carbon in its whole lifetime is those first few years. So it's actually really important to start now. 
and to get as many trees in the ground as we can, because the older the tree gets, the less and less and less carbon it, it sequesters per year. So that's a science-driven fact. Now, bonus for trees is that they help us with reducing urban temperatures, which are spiking through the roof because all the asphalt we have around. Also helps with urban flooding, it turns out, which is another risk of ongoing climate change. So double bonus points for trees. And here's a picture of my kids and I planting trees on a, what was the one of the record coldest days, Martin Luther King Day of service. It was below zero when we planted these trees. The ground was literally frozen. So maybe choose a better day, but, um, but generally it's a lot of fun. Get people outdoors thinking about urban trees. One tree is a thousand pounds of CO2 by the time it matures. So that's a lot of carbon. That's more carbon than I save biking to work every day, uh, which I do as well. So last but not least, you can show the world that you care. There's one of my kids back there. You can show the world that you care by talking about climate change and the fact that you care about it and showing people that you care about it. So here's a picture of my family and, my, and myself participating in the global climate strike, which occur every six months or so now under the umbrella of an organization called Fridays for Future. We were striking outside their elementary school and you can see some of their friends there. I, I blacked out their faces, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And that's how we can collectively show the world that we care about climate change and schools turn out to be an incredibly important way to get this message across. And young people started this movement and I'm convinced that they will be some of the ones that are gonna get the job done. And us grownups will be here to help you and support you along the way. So with that, I will end my formal presentation and hope that we have time for questions. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Dr. Cobb, for such a neat presentation as always. Um, and yeah, I've been saying we've done a lot of climate presentations the last few months, and I like to highlight that literally it is kids these days. I think a lot of people thought it would be my generation, and it's not. It's 16-year-olds and younger that are doing the bulk of this work, marching with millions of people around the world to do this. So thank you so much for highlighting that in your talk. Um, all right, we've got people tuning in from across Ontario, from Peru and Chile, which is really exciting, and more. So if you guys on YouTube want to type in your questions in the chat bar, I will take as many as we possibly can in our next 15 minutes. But first, to kick us off, I want to ask a question about that chart you show with corals that are experiencing bleaching. They were really close to the coast. They were trending southwards, and they were trending closer to Australia than further out. Is there a reason for that, that we see that sort of trend? Yeah, let's go back and take a close look at that because there are some very distinct patterns here. Yeah. So I think that there are a smattering of corals that are farther away being hit. So you can see down here on the southernmost portion of the reef, um, there are some very outermost reefs that are being heavily impacted as well as, of course, a very good portion of inshore reefs. And so that really will depend on the local dynamics of the ocean circulation in that region at a given time. So I remember during the last major bleaching event that they had in 2016 and 2017, um, it virtually no reef was spared across the northern portion of the reef. And so these patterns just vary year by year and event by event. Unfortunately, over the Great Barrier Reef, once you add 2016, 2017, and now 2020, which are three bleaching events that occurred on the Great Barrier Reef in the last uh, five years, uh, there are virtually no reefs that will have escaped some level of bleaching. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's disheartening, but uh, I, we appreciate the information. Um, or, power. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Young family, who has joined us for like 20 programs in the last couple of weeks, which is so fantastic, they ask the question they always do, which is, what is your favorite part of your job, Kim? <laughs> I think, I, I used to say it was, okay, yeah, there we go. I, I'm uh, just giving a webinar. Okay, well, you can go on out, sweetheart. Okay. Um, I used to say it was, it was the field work, but now I've been taking a pledge about uh, staying on the ground for 2020. And so that's kind of clipped my wings, if you will. And, and my students are, of course, out there conducting field work um, as, as young budding scientists. So I think now the most important part and meaningful part of my job is educating the next generation. And so in my role at Georgia Tech, I am so honored to get in front of dozens of graduate students um, every year and undergraduate students every year and really help them understand what we're up against this century and how they can be part of the solution. 
And that's become ever more important to me. And I put ever more time into it as well. And trying to be nimble and agile as an educator in this environment is what, what it's about as the, the just the, the records mount and, and the solutions become more clear. How can we get that in the hands of not just college students, but also uh, K through 12 students? That is the challenge. That's where we can bring technologies like this to bear on the problem. Fantastic. Um, or we had a question about one of the things in your, your bio that you had passed along to us. Uh, what is the International Cleavar Pacific Panel? <laughs> a little bit about that. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, something that I was participating in for about six years or so. And it's, it's basically a international level organization that's focused on understanding the, and predicting climate change on timescales from six months to decades. And so that's the time scales of climate change. And so this is a consortium, the Pacific panel in particular, brings together scientists from all the countries around the Pacific Ocean. So if you touch the Pacific Ocean, you probably have some representation on this international panel. I was honored to represent the United States for six years on the panel, sitting next to colleagues from China and Peru and Australia and Fiji, um, all over the world. And we get together every year and we ask ourselves, how has our science advanced? And how can we bring this information to policymakers and the public uh, to enhance our understanding of climate and keep people safe and, and keep policies closely aligned? And so our biggest focus on the panel was El Nino because that's the most honorary climate cycle that emerges from the Pacific Ocean. So it was, it was really fun for the six years I was on it. Excited to see El Nino in Pacific climate research accelerate over that time frame so, so, so much. Of course, 2016 being the record-breaking event that occurred during my tenure on the panel. So that was an exclamation part right there. Very cool. Thank you so much. All right. You mentioned returning to the same field sites for decades, and I'm curious why specifically. Can you explain to people tuning in why that's so important to continue research in one field site for a long period of time? Yes, so I am very committed to that as a strategy, and I kind of take it to an extreme. I've only worked, in fact, at two field sites over my entire career, which spans, again, uh, 20, 25 years now. And so I do that because once you dedicate yourself to a research site and you collect some samples and you start reconstructing climate using some of these samples, uh, the more you can pour into this site to understand about its, uh, how it records climate extremes, for example, um, and the more nuanced uh, signals that you can learn about when you look really, really closely and when you build a huge ton of data to support your research, um, then you can just answer more fine scale questions. And it is these kinds of questions that we're grappling with today in climate science. It's really no longer about is the planet warming more than it has in millennia. Yes, it is. We know that very well. Now we're really asking questions like, okay, is the El Nino climate cycle, which is a natural climate cycle, is it getting worse with climate change? And it turns out that is one of the hardest questions to answer. And it turns out that this particular research site that I've started studying is one of the best suited sites in the entire world to answer that question. And so if I do nothing else with my entire career, but help pile on the next brick of knowledge that addresses that question, um, I will call it a success. So we have had some uh, very recent evidence that points to the fact that climate change may be making this natural climate cycle worse, but we've had to amass 20 years of data over 20 different expeditions to this site uh, and dozens of NSF grants to be able to say that. So that's what the treasure that we get at the end of this rainbow, but yes, it is a long rainbow and yes, it helps to be you know, hitting the same nail for 20 years. Very cool. I like long rainbow as a metaphor. I don't know we've had that one before. Um, Kim, just a quick thing I forgot to mention, if you want to come out of screen share so we can see you, you're welcome to. You're also welcome to stay in screen share, whatever you'd like. Yeah. Um, perfect. All right. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions, uh, but I'll go back to the young family for this. How did you decide to study this and what is your career path? Like, do, What sort of studying do people need to do if they want to end up with your job? Oh my goodness. I mean, the good news is you can approach my job from, from many, many, many different lines of science. And so um, I've had uh, undergraduates come into my lab to do research where they're 
they're basically charting a path that looks a lot like mine over the years that they were work with me. And indeed, now they're kind of graduating on and have moved on to positions that are um, in various different places of climate science. But I've taken students into my research lab from math backgrounds with math majors, uh, civil engineering, industrial engineering, uh, chemistry, of course, earth science, um, economics. So uh, you can really approach this field of earth science from any different kind of entry points. The important thing is to keep science close to you, <laughs> to keep science and particularly math close to you as well. Um, and then you can have any number of different doors open to you um, that you can't even see until you get to college and sometimes beyond. And so uh, when you get to college, you know, take a look around, uh, see all the diversity of things that are going on in the research environment around you and get started somewhere. And then it's a kind of a choose your own adventure through there. Why did I end up here? Um, I've always loved the ocean. I've had a, a strong tie to it from when I was a small child. And I think a lot of people do. I think that's a very human common thing to have. So that doesn't make me special. Um, but what does, what was extremely important to me was to have an experience in my undergraduate years that helped me understand that marine science and climate science was actually a whole career <laughs> that I really didn't understand. I thought marine science was about dolphins and whales. I really had no idea that you could use the ocean to unlock some of the most important climate mysteries of our planet as we seek to uh, hopefully solve this whole problem this century. So once I put those pieces together, I thought, oh, the ocean and climate, and I could solve something, um, it was done for me. And I, I just put my sights on that and have been chasing that ever since. Yeah, and from the pictures you showed, you found the most beautiful field sites in the entire world too, which must be a huge benefit. <laughs> Certainly when people said, you know, why corals? I said, well, definitely not ice cores. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, we had a question about the other element of your work. So again, in your bio, we had highlighted corals and caves. You focused on corals today. So Fatima wants to know, when you study caves, do you do it in the same sort of fashion? Do you go to the same site regularly? Anything you can share with us on caves would be fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to do another one of these on caves because it's my other core passion area. And corals were my first passion. But um, if you think about it in some ways, caves, the lagmites, which are those rocks that are creating on the floor of caves very, very slowly, are kind of like the corals of the land. And so they grow much more slowly, but we apply the exact same techniques to those caves, the lagmites. Whereas a coral core that's a foot long maybe uh, contain 20 years of information, um, a stalagmite that is a foot long could be 10,000 years of climate history. And I've been applying this technique in the deep jungles of Borneo for about 15 years now, not quite as long as corals. And I've been working at the same sites for all the same reasons I talked about before, uh, because the deeper we look into the site, the more treasures we find and the more we're able to understand these very precious and actually priceless rock records that we're pulling out of these caves. I really want to make an important note about cave preservation here because we work in partnership with the Malaysian government and the forestry service and the national park service. We have field guides with us at all times. We have all relevant permits and we are not allowed to just go around with a sledgehammer knocking cave formations off that have taken millions of years to form in many cases and are literally irreplaceable. So we use drills to extract some material very carefully and we use a lot of fallen stalagmites. 95% of our collection is fallen stalagmites that allow us to peer into the geologic past, look at ice ages, abrupt climate change, and other climate phenomena that exist over these longer time frames from a very data poor region as well. Uh, I just want to highlight for everyone on YouTube, if you guys are really keen on caves, in addition to totally taking up Dr. Cobb and the offer of a cave one of these in the future, check out uh, George Karunas' session. We did one a couple months ago uh, featuring the Nika Crystal Cave in Mexico, one of the most unique ecosystems in the world, and why it's so important to preserve it. A quick follow-up on this. You mentioned stalagmites coming from the ground. Are stalactites hanging from the ceiling different, or are they? can you use them as well or not? Some people have, you know, successfully used cave stalactites, but most work has focused on cave stalagmites, the ones growing from the ground, because stalactites have a tendency to grow thick sometimes, instead of sometimes they grow down and sometimes they grow thick. And cave stalagmites, the drip is always dripping on the same place. 
And so we're fairly confident in the chronology of time marching upwards in a cave stalagmite, whereas a cave stalactite, sometimes time marches downwards, sometimes it marches outwards, and that's not very handy for building a continuous climate record. All right, fantastic. I learned a lot from that too, thank you so much. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass along one more question from YouTube and then I'm gonna wrap up with a general one that we'd like to, to highlight. Uh, so uh, Spencer asked, do you ever get nervous before a dive? We showed these pictures of you down in the, the deep sea floor. Do you get afraid of that or what is your diving experience? Look, you know, diving is no joke. And um, if I'm diving recreationally, I'm enjoying myself. I'm just hanging out. I'm looking at the scenery. I'm looking forward to sapping some good photos, making some good memories. When I'm leading a team of divers down for a research dive at a site, that is a six hour evacuation by a C-130 that has to come from Honolulu in order to get you to a chamber is gonna be 14 hours from the call that I make. Um, that's a very different situation. I am very focused. I am very concerned about the conditions that I'm putting my divers into. And we are reviewing all safety plans and rescue plans and backup measures. We're having conversations about comfort. We're all business. So um, it really is a very special privilege and honor to dive at these extremely remote sites, but it is also some of the most harrowing experiences I have ever had just as somebody who holds the responsibility of the team's safety in, the, in their hands. Nothing I take more serious than that. So thanks for that question, a chance to remind readers um, how important it is to conduct a safe field research at all times. Absolutely. And two quick follow-ups on that to say for people tuning in at home, and I know we do have some 10-year-olds today, you can start diving at 10 years old. You can get on the path of becoming a scuba diver then. It's one of the coolest things you'll ever do. Uh, highlighting the, the more fun aspect of it is neat there. And if you're keen to follow up on some of the dangers of diving and the preparation that goes into that, Jill Heinerth, we've had on her program five to six times, and she is one of the world's elite cave divers. If you want to check out her programs, they're very, very neat. Um, Dr. Cobb, before we wrap up, there are some, you mentioned solutions that kids can do from home with regards to helping corals. Um, I wanna highlight some of the more scientific ones, uh, genetically engineering corals not to bleach so easily, artificial reefs. Are there things that are happening in the scientific community that present real hope for coral, maintaining coral reefs uh, in the years to come that, that you think of? Yes, absolutely. So I think we have a lot to learn about coral reef resilience. And one of the things I like to remind viewers is that as much as those pictures I showed you were just devastating um, with the 85, 90% losses that we experienced on our reef in the Central Pacific, um, those represent a scientific gold mine to understand the secrets for coral resilience from a science perspective, because guess what? 5% of those corals actually survived that very sustained ocean warming. So why did they survive is now one of the most important and pressing and exciting questions to emerge from our research site now. And so this is the work of Dr. Julia Baum, who's looking into the genetics of those individuals, the tissue compositions, the symbiont types and numbers to try to figure out why they survived. So that's a, an exciting area. I can't stress enough to those folks who are thinking about um, careers that to think about a career that's focused on coral reef science in the 21st century will be hugely important and very dynamic. Another effort that Jesse just mentioned is uh, basically genetically engineering uh, heat resistant and acidification resistant corals because it's not just ocean temperatures that are creeping up with climate change, of course, it is uh, ocean pH levels which are going down as we add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and therefore the surface ocean. So by you like might breed a, a prize poodle to try to win a fancy dog show, um, you could actually try to breed a heat resistant coral to resist some of the temperature extremes of the 21st century. Very promising work, very early work. Maybe one day we will be able to rely on those kinds of hardy stocks of climate tolerant corals to reseed the reefs that we've lost in this first half of the century as we dilly dallied on emission reduction. Fantastic, Dr. Hub. Um, and again, for everyone tuning in at home, we have ocean playlists, we have biodiversity playlists. Corals are one of our favorite topics here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So if you want to check out and learn even more from some top scientists and explorers around the globe, do check us out. Um, Dr. Cobb, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, for everyone tuning in at home, thank you so much for watching. And then keep tuning in on YouTube and check us out on our site.
Thank you so much, Kim, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much, Jesse. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.